morning, everybody. It's uh, great to be able to be a part of this service and um, see those beautiful kids up the front. Uh, before I jump in, I'd just like to just give you an update on Carly. Um, many of you know a few, well, some, many of you would have been here about a month or two ago when I shared about the but if not faith, how so often, you know, we are quick to jump in and judge God based on a situation that we really don't see the eternal perspective on. And um, if we just wait, we'll often see something better come. And even if we don't, God is still good. And um, yeah, well, my wife, after giving birth to our son four months ago, ended up getting appendicitis a month or six weeks ago now. And um, on the specimen specimen of the appendix that got sent off to the lab, there was a few, uh, two millimetres only of um, what's called a carcinoid tumour. It's a very rare type of cancer that um, is very, uh, normally quite slow growing and almost undetectable until uh, it's metastasized or spread throughout the body, at which stage it's too late to treat, and there's, there's no effective treatment for that. And um, so fortunately, by Carly getting the appendicitis, we discovered the diagnosis, and just this past week, she's had a, about half of her large bowel um, chopped out and plugged back together again. And... Um, all, all has been going really well, and so we really appreciate your prayers and all the support that people have offered. We've just been totally blown away and blessed by the church community. And then yesterday we found out uh, that, yeah, that there certainly had been no spread in any of the lymph nodes. So basically all clear, considered cured, and um, we're just so grateful to God for um, that happening um, forgetting the appendicitis um, so that we were able to d discover it before it had been able to spread it all. So, you know, God works in mysterious ways and he's a good God, he's a good father. And so, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you guys and say thanks so much for, for the wonderful support and prayer you guys as a family have been. Now, I thought today, given today's the, the child dedication service, that uh, would make this um, sermon about kids and why they're the greatest. But um, not just why they're the greatest, but how in order to become the greatest, we need to become as children. See, there's a lot of things we can learn from kids. For instance, my eldest, Micah, taught me that um, the way we get nostrils is by picking our nose, and that's how air can get up there. <laughs> um, an interesting insight. <laughs> He, he gave me his remedy for hair growth, which I'm starting to need soon, um, which is simply this. Run around, get sweaty, and then your hair gets all watered, so it grows. <laughs> my, I'm, a, I'm the father of four little rambunctious boys. Um, the third one, Josiah, he's, he's the one we call our cheeky guy, or Josiren, because he's so loud all the time. Um, always walking around the house going, ooh, ooh, ooh. Anyway, he, he catches on, he, he gets a few words that uh, he just uses way too much. One of his favourite words was nothing, because so, basically it came from Josiah, what are you doing? Nothing, always, you know, up to mischief. Josiah, um, did you just hit um, Eli? Nothing, like even when it doesn't make sense. <laughs> And uh, anyway, last Christmas, actually, he, Carly um, took him and the other boys to go see Santa at, um, I think it was in Maya, and sitting on Santa's lap, um, you know, the, the other boys have all gone, Mike is certainly going to want Lego, and Eli's going to want Lego because Michael wants Lego, and Josiah's turn comes up and Santa says, what would you like for Christmas, young boy? And Josiah thinks, looks around and goes, nothing! <laughs> Not the usual response that Santa would get. Um, he also has some funny words that um, bottom was one of his favourite words. It's his naughty, naughty word. Anyway, he'd just say bottom to everything. And one day, as we often do, we we're riding along to church on a beautiful sunny day like this. And I had him on the back on the little um, unicycle bike thing that attaches to my bike and we're riding along and this lady's walking along the other way and she goes, oh, it's a beautiful day for a bike ride, isn't it? And Josiah, just as we're going past, just goes, bottom! <laughs> Rides off. 
So yeah, you can learn some interesting things from, from kids. Eli, my second eldest boy, is the, the one holding little Jesse in that photo. He's a gorgeous little boy, as, as all of them are, of course. Um, but Eli always wanted and, and still wants to be bigger. When can I be bigger, Dad? How can I be? When I'm bigger, can I drive a car? When I'm bigger, can I buy more Lego? When I'm bigger? And he's just perpetually desperate to get bigger so that he can do things that bigger people can do. And one day we're riding our bikes again and Eli looks at me and goes, Dad, I wish I could be God. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's an interesting thing to say. Fair enough. Why do you wish you could be God? And he goes, well, because then I'd finally be bigger than you. <laughs> <laughs> See, and then I, I told my dad and uh, he said, well, did you let him know historically that's not always such a good idea? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so kids always want to get bigger. Can't wait to be grown up and bigger and get to do adult things. But today, really, what we're going to look at is how we need to actually go back to becoming kids again. Because, as Jesus tells us, when he was talking with his disciples um, around the, the region of Capernaum, and they were discussing amongst themselves who would be the greatest. A whole lot of pride getting in the way of, um, of their relationships. And, as, and it says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 to 4, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of the heaven? Interesting question to ask, isn't it? And calling to him a child, he, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to learn some things from little babies today. A lot of the stuff I've um, learned just from observation from our kids. We're going to learn that to be truly the greatest, to be the greatest heroes in the kingdom, we actually need to become like these guys in some ways. So three things I want to talk about today. The first of which is innocence. You see, children, when you think of children, one of the first things that comes to mind is they're innocent. When something bad happens to kids, you know, and uh, you know, they get sick or they die, everyone first of all goes, oh, the poor thing, they were so innocent. It's something that we just automatically ascribe to, to children because they're so young, how can they do anything wrong? It doesn't take them long to move beyond that. <laughs> uh, but certainly the little guy sleeping there in my mum's arms there, Perfectly innocent, beautiful. And when Jesus says that if you want to become the greatest uh, and if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, in one sense he's saying that we need to take on his innocence. We need his righteousness. Jesus, when speaking to Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this is a wonderful, wonderful thing that God calls us to. See, we hear the, the, the term, I'm a born-again Christian, thrown around and even used in a derogatory fashion so often. But isn't it just the greatest thing in the world that we get to be born again, that we get to have a clean slate? I mean, how many of you guys have lived life, made mistakes and gone, if only I could start again? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if all those stupid things, if all those evil things, if all those wrong things that I've done weren't permanently on my record, if I could have the slate completely wiped clean, that would be a wonderful thing. You see, so often we think if we come to God, he can maybe fix us and help something, you know, help us to get those, those little issues in our life that aren't quite right. Maybe we have a problem with lust. Maybe we have a problem with jealousy. And if, if God could fix those, that would be all right. But that's not how God works. God says, come to me, die. Be born again. Have my Holy Spirit indwell in you, my seed in you, so that you can be, become, as, as it says in 1 John 3 verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Take, take a moment to let that sink into your head because it's something that we bandy around in church so often, we sing about so often that it can become too familiar to us, just the great significance of what it is to have the innocence of Christ 
ascribed to us. In 1 John 3, 9 to 10, he says, No one born of God makes a practice of sin, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. I mean, do you understand that? If we have the Spirit of God living in us, we cannot go on sinning. Now, yes, I know there's the problem of the now and not yet. Now I have the Spirit of God in me, but not yet. Because, well, but in the sense that I do still sin. Yeah, everybody does. But the Holy Spirit, God's seed in me, does not sin. I am born again. I'm a new creation. It says, but it, by this it is evident who the children of God and who the children of the devil. And who are the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. See, as Christians, we get the opportunity to be born again, to have his nature inside of us so that it is no longer us who goes on sinning, but our old self. It's a whole another message for another time, the, the sort of the deep theology behind that. But it's a wonderful thing. And that's why in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. A new creation. How wonderful is that? The old has passed away. All that evil, all that wrong, all that stupidness that we've done in our lives no longer counted against us. All and the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses or their sins against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is profound, profound truth that we're reading right there. The righteousness of God. God ascribes that to those who would become his children. So we see to become the greatest in the kingdom, to enter the kingdom of heaven, we need God's innocence. We need his righteousness. The second thing is we need God's undeserved favor as God's children. What we call grace. So this little guy in the picture here, what do you think might be going through his mind? You think, man, I was so good in that race. I made it to the egg first. What a champion I am. Of course I deserve to be born. Well, it's kind of ridiculous to think of a baby earning their birth, earning their existence, isn't it? It's kind of a, a crazy thing because a baby is created by God Obviously, I'm not going to go into the details of how that plays out. But for his delight, not through anything that the baby has done. See, it says in Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we couldn't earn it. We couldn't do anything to make us worthy of becoming God's children, to make us worthy of God's salvation. And this is sort of the, one of the big things that differentiates Christianity from pretty much every other religion in the world. Christianity, God's, God is reaching out to us. He's extending his offer of grace to us, his undeserved favor, even in the midst of all our sin. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. There's nothing our babies can do to earn being born. They are because of the grace of God. Whereas other religions, it's very much about, and you know, maybe and certainly often, very noble intentions of becoming better people, of trying to please God and appease Him. You know, Muslims will keep their five pillars where they have to give a certain amount, where they have to pray five times a day, they have to go on pilgrimage, all these things to try to earn their way to God. Hindus will practice yoga and meditation and offer sacrifices to their gods in order to somehow find um, acceptability, in order to somehow improve their karma and make it better for them in the future. Secular humanists have their own set of um, criteria that they use to judge what it is to be a good person, not necessarily to try to get um, to heaven, 
But if there is something better, to make sure that they do get there. But God says, no, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you enter it as a child, as a baby, just receiving the grace of God, not because of anything you bring, but because God is a good God who loves us so deeply, just like a father loves their child. And because of that, we can rest very happy and very secure. You see, if my salvation depended on what I did, I'd be stuffed. I wouldn't be up here right now. I would be in a lot of trouble. But because my salvation depends on who God is, I can be like this little guy, like my little boy Jesse lying, uh, sitting over there right now. I can be completely f- um, free, completely free of worry, free of anxiety, because I know that when I die, that my salvation is secure in God, in Christ Jesus. I have every, uh, for little Jesse there, every single cell that he has, has my DNA flowing through it. Or maybe not flowing around it, but in the nucleus, and we won't go into the details. But he's my son. He can't become my unson. He is my son. He is the creature. He's the creation of my wife and myself. And in the same way, I am God's son. When he made me born again, when he made me a new creation, that is something that God will see through to the end. And so I can take seriously the passages in um, Matthew 6.25 that says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? So to enter the kingdom of heaven, to be the greatest, we need to become a child that understands that there's nothing that we can do to earn God's favour, but he's a good father that extends his grace to us. And we need to receive that. Flowing on from that is the third thing, which is agape love or unconditional love. It's a love that isn't dependent on emotion. It doesn't come and go as our feelings change and chop and change like like the wind, but it's a love that is built on will, a will to love, despite whatever circumstances happen, despite what we do. It is an unconditional love. And you know what? As I first held my little boy there four months ago in my arms, I got an understanding of what that love is. You see, little Jesse had done nothing whatsoever to deserve my love, so to speak. You know, he hadn't bought me a house or cleaned up after the dog or done anything. In fact, he just caused a whole lot of pain to my wife. (laughs) Yet as I held him in my arms for the first time, love just poured out of every part of my being. A love because of who he is, because I'm his father. And as I held him, I just praised God and thanked him that I could have this little guy, this little bundle of joy. Not because of anything he's done or even necessarily anything he'll do. In fact, I know from very good experience, that he's going to cause me a lot of harm in the future. (laughs) That there's going to be lots of times where I'm tearing my hair out and going, really, do you have to do that? I just packed that up. Can you stop hitting your brothers? Why would you do that? (laughs) And so on and so forth. But I'm going to love him to the day I die with every ounce of my being because he is my child, because he is my son. And nothing will change that. And you know what? When God says you need to become born again, you need to be like my child, that is the sort of love that God is talking about. It's not a love that's dependent on our successes or our failures. It's a love of a father for his child that he has made. And it's an incredible thing. And I think parents are extra blessed in that they have this um, different insight that once you hold your child for the first time, you understand and it all makes sense and you go, God, I get it now. And again, because of that, we can be at peace. We can be free 
to enjoy this relationship with God, to enjoy the life that he's given us. And of course, that then leads on to the works. It leads on to the fact that if I'm my, fa- if I'm my father's child, I want to be like my father. My boys, often people see them and go, yeah, he's just like his father. <laughs> Normally, it's when they're misbehaving, though. And so, in order to become the greatest, we need to be like children and receive this agape love, this unconditional love. Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, though, as he mentioned and brought up the kids and and said, you've got to be like these kids, was addressing one big thing in particular. And that's what C.S. Lewis terms the great sin or pride. See, pride is what turns Lucifer, the great angel of light, into Satan, who wasn't happy enough with how things were. He thought he was better than he was and that he deserved more. And so he rebelled against God. And of all these wonderful, great things that we've talked about, I mean, who wouldn't want unconditional love? Who wouldn't want a clean slate? Who wouldn't want the innocence that Christ imparts to us? But strangely enough, somehow our pride gets in the way. There's something in us that says, I want to bring, you know, I'm happy for heaven, but because I'm a good person, not because I'm a sinner to the core in desperate need of um, forgiveness. No, no, no. Sort of our typical white middle class moral Australian society says, if God's a good God, I'll be right. Rather than coming, being humbled as Jesus says we must be, saying, God, I know at my very being that I've sinned and that I need you and that there is no other way to enter the kingdom of heaven but through becoming a child, through humbling myself and repenting, turning from my evil ways and saying, God, put your spirit in me. My righteousness is not enough. Give me your righteousness. Give me the righteousness of your son. God, I love, but in so many ways it's so selfish. In so many ways it's tainted. God, give me your agape love. Give me your unconditional love so that I might know what it is to be your child. God, impart your grace onto me because even though I don't deserve it, that's the whole point of it. Help me not to get hung up on the fact that I'm so unworthy. (laughs) You know, some people actually reject God's gift of salvation because they feel unworthy. Because they say, well, look, that's great for you guys, but if you knew what was in my heart, if you knew the sin that I'd done, you'd know that I can't be forgiven. And God says, well, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of Christianity. We are not worthy. And that's what grace is, God's undeserved favour, because he is a good, good father. And he loves us so greatly. So to finish up, to be the greatest, we must become the least. To inherit the kingdom of God, we must become as children. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I'm going to invite the band up. We're going to sing one more song that really responds quite well to what we've been talking about today in worship of our good, good Father. So I want you to join with us as we sing this last one.